right, once again, let me just say good morning and welcome you to the Digital Cathedral here in Houston, Texas. Well, it's kind of cool when it's a digital cathedral because it really doesn't matter where it comes from, does it? It just moves out all over the whole world. And I want to welcome a worldwide audience and remind you that you're part of something that's bigger than you are right now. We're part of a reformation that is, that is just spreading around the world like wildfire. People are, are beginning to see with open eyes levels and revelation and mysteries that they've never seen before. Freedom is setting in in the hearts of people, and I'll tell you, it's a great day to be alive. So wherever you're watching me from this morning, welcome, and I'm glad that you're part of a larger family that's not just confined to a locale in a city or a part of a city, but we're part of something that's, that's worldwide. All right, I want to begin over in John chapter 16 this morning, and we're going to take this message, Embracing Grace. We're going to go with it just a little bit farther today. Push off from the shore just a little bit. So I want you to just open up your mind, open up your hearts, and let's receive some truth today. John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus says something that, I, that I'm sure startled the disciples when they first heard it. Probably talk among themselves later about what is Jesus talking about here. John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus says, Nevertheless, guys, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I go not away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send this helper to you. Now watch what his mission is. And this helper, verse 8 says, when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they don't believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Then he picks it up down in verse 12. And he says, I still have a lot of things to say to you, but you can't hear them yet. Isn't it amazing that as we progress in this message of grace, as we go deeper in this, we, we get prepared. Our ears tend to open up and our eyes tend to open up and we can hear and we can see more than what we did before. It seems, it seems like, you know, in this walk, we think, man, I'm, I'm prepared. Give me the whole thing, Jesus. Give me the whole truth. But Jesus is very plain in saying, you know, th this is a journey. This isn't a sprint. This isn't a microwave. It's a crock pot. He takes us just a little bit at a time as we're able to embrace it and grab hold of it. And that's why uh, we're 20 messages into this. I think that he's progressively got us on a journey. And so each week we take just a little bit more. So Jesus says in that 12th verse, he says, guys, I've got a lot of, lot, lot of more things to tell you, but you can't bear them yet. But he says in verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. Now that is the only, that is the only thing that Jesus ever said that he would give us that would guide us into all truth. It was the spirit of truth. Let me read this again. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he, the spirit of truth, will guide you into all truth. You know, we really haven't given the spirit of truth that lives within us. I don't think we've given him uh, the rightful place that we should. We haven't relied on him enough. We haven't developed our perceptivity to what he's trying to say to us. We've kind of relied on the Bible, haven't we? We've relied on a book to do what Jesus said the spirit of truth would do. So we'll get into that maybe in one of our religion busters. But in verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So let's go back uh, in that seventh verse where Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage, it is to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the comforter, the helper will not come. But if I go away, I will send him to you. Now, I bet you, the, I bet you the disciples did a double take when they heard Jesus say that. I bet their minds kind of went over on tilt when Jesus said, it's better for you if I go away. Now, put yourself in their position. They had walked and talked with Jesus on a very personal level now for almost three years. And Jesus comes along one day and out of the clear blue, he says, guys, it's better for you if I go away. It's better for you. It's, it's going to be to your advantage if I'm no longer standing here physically beside you. Now, why would Jesus say that? Why would Jesus, why would Jesus uh, uh, tell them, guys, it's better that I'm not here with you physically? 
Well, there's probably several reasons, but I think the, 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 the core issue here is that Jesus knew if he didn't leave, that they would always be looking to him for their source. And that was not the end game when the father sent the son. Jesus knew that as long as he was there, now think about it, he'd been there three years. They had relied on Jesus to provide everything they needed, all their food, their lodging, uh, every need that they had. They just looked to Jesus and Jesus took care of it, right? Now, all of a sudden, he's saying, I'm not going to be with you. However, me not being with you is going to be to your advantage. <clears throat> What's Jesus doing here? Jesus is beginning to show them that they're going to have to learn to function out of the same spirit for supply, for, for, for provision, for understanding, for revelation, out of the same spirit that led and guided him. Let me say it this way. Jesus was saying, fellas, you're going to have to learn sonship like I learned it, and you're going to have to begin to embrace your divinity as I have demonstrated for you and I have embraced mine. As long as Jesus was there with them physically, he could not multiply himself. He could only be at one place at one time. But Jesus is saying, when I go, I'm sending the helper back. The helper is going to lead you into all truth. And as you learn to embrace your divinity, as you learn to walk in the fullness of your sonship, then I'm going to be able to multiply myself in 12 others. And when the day of Pentecost came, it was... Uh, uh, thousands of others. And through that first century, the, the entire gospel spread over the earth. And so Jesus had, because he left, he then had the potential of having sons, duplicates of himself, join heirs with him, spread all over the whole world. Now, John caught it. I think John, John was able to see this a little bit. And that famous verse that I read all the time out of 1 John 4, 17, it's my life's verse, actually. I want this first case that any of you are living when I'm gone. I want this verse on my tombstone. 1 John 4, 17. This is John caught what Jesus was after. John said, Here in his love made perfect, that you may have boldness in the day of judgment. I like that boldness in the day of judgment thing because most people think on the day of judgment, it's, it's going to be a time to cower down and be afraid. No, 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 no. Because you've already been judged righteous, you're going to have boldness. Then, then the line really hits where John says, I get what Jesus was saying. When Jesus was saying it's better for him to go away, it would be to our benefit. I'm, I'm getting, I get what he says because that last part of that 17th verse says, because as he is, so are we in this present world. Now, when, when Jesus told the guys this, he wasn't trying to create insecurity, and it probably created some insecurity to begin with because this was, this was a news flash straight from heaven. They had never considered the fact that Jesus was not going to be there. Jesus was not trying to make them more insecure, but in fact was trying to build a base of security that would help them live their life on a level they had not lived it up to that point. Jesus is telling them, it, this is going to be better for you. At first, they probably thought there's no way this is going to be better. So Jesus is trying to build some security that, guys, I've brought you to a place now where you can begin to live and function on your own, not having me physically here with you, and you're going to go places and do things that you never thought you could as long as I was here. In, in John chapter 14... Let's, let's read a couple of verses from John chapter 14, verses 16, 17, and 18. And I want you to understand, Jesus wasn't trying <clears throat> to build into them uh, insecurity, or he wasn't trying to get them to say, oh, Jesus, please don't leave us. He wasn't trying to get it, any of that. In John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. So this is pretty much what Jesus was saying uh, Two chapters later in verse, in chapter 16, he had already kind of laid a little groundwork. He said, I'll pray the Father and he will give you another helper, another one. Jesus was the original helper, right? So he's going to give them another helper that he may abide, that he may, uh, that he may live with you forever. Now, the helper that's coming back, here's what Jesus is saying. The helper coming back that I'm going to send He's going to walk with you. He's going to talk with you. He's going to fulfill any void in your life exactly as I did. And this one is not going to leave. He's going to be with you 
forever. Now let's, let's read on just a little bit. Verse 17, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't see him, it doesn't know him, but you'll know him for he will dwell with you, with you and be in you. So not only with, but in. Verse 17, a little while and the world will see me no more, but you'll see me because I live, you will live also. So Jesus Jesus, again, is reiterating this fact that it's to their advantage, but don't sweat it. Don't worry about it. There's one coming that's going to take my place, going to take you into dimensions, take you into levels of consciousness, into truth that you don't know now, but you will know. So he's trying to, he's trying to undergird this, trying to give them security. He's saying, I will come back in the form of this helper as the Father came to you in my image. Jesus came as a full representative, as a full manifestation of the Father, full reflection of the Father. Jesus is saying, in the same way, when the helper comes, I will come to you. It will be me coming to you in the form of the Holy Spirit. So in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was come, uh, we find out that in Acts chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, that what Joel had prophesied came to pass and the Spirit was poured out on all flesh. Not just charismatic flesh, not just Christian flesh. The Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh. So all men now have within them this helper that will lead them, direct them, and guide them. Do all men know that? No. Do all men perceive that? No. Are all men living uh, under the direction of this helper? Absolutely not. Why? Because they've never been taught that one dwells in them and has been sent. So when we look, we look, at, we look at Jesus, you know, and, and, and we understand that what he's saying to us is that I have poured out my essence on all flesh. Now the fact is all flesh is blind to that. We're, we're a little bit, you know, we look at the Jews and we, we look down on the Jews because they're waiting for Jesus to come the first time. They're waiting for Jesus to come set up a kingdom, meet their needs, supply what they have, take vengeance on their enemies. And we look at them and we say, well, Jesus has already come the first time. And yet most of the church is looking for him to physically return the second time to do for them the second time what the Jews are looking for Jesus to come do the first time, which is to meet their needs, to bring peace, security, set up a kingdom. And the whole time Jesus was trying to explain to them, guys, I'm leaving, but you're going to be doing what I did. You're going to be carrying this kingdom forward. So we're just waking up now. The humanity is just waking up to the fact that he is, he is fully back. He has fully come in the form of sons. And that was always the plan. It was never the plan that Jesus come back a second time. I don't want to, I hate, I hope, hope I'm not shaking your world too bad. It was never the plan he come back for a second time, physically himself. The plan was that he would manifest in many sons. The plan was that he would fulfill his plan on the earth, that the kingdom would spread that the leaven in the lump would fully leaven the lump through multiples of sons. It's to your advantage that I go away. But if I go away, I will send a helper and he will be with you. He will guide you into all truth and he will show you things to come. Are, are, are you with me? All right. Now, I want you to catch this. I want you to catch this. So here's, where, here's, here's kind of where we're living. We're learning that we are not to look to Jesus for anything. But we are, in fact, to look as Jesus. All right? I want you to get those eyes of Jesus going. See, you have the mind of Christ. So let's start seeing as Jesus. Let's stop, let's stop looking to Jesus to give us something that he has already provided for us to have through the spirit of truth that lives in us that will lead us and guide us to all truth and to all things. All right? So now we don't look to Jesus, it was expedient for him to go away so he could send the helper to do for us what he had uh, done for those 12 physically for three years. There's no difference. 
If, if Jesus, when he was here physically with those 12, met their needs, supplied what they have, then you and I need to begin to see as Jesus sees and understand that he will do as us. So we're not looking to Jesus, we're looking as Jesus. We, we see needs as Jesus sees. We see situations as Jesus sees. We see circumstances as Jesus sees. We see problems as Jesus sees. We look as Jesus looks. Okay, here's the point. The point is this. We are the enchristed ones. That's what grace and freedom from religion is all about. You are the enchristed one. You, you are... Uh, uh, the one that he has sent to finish, to finish his finished work, if I can say it that way. He finished his work. Let me say it this way. He finished the work. Now, it's our job to demonstrate it. Jesus made sure when he was here, he finished it. He said, I'm leaving. I'm going to send the spirit of truth so that now you can demonstrate what I have put within all men. Now, the writer of Hebrews Writer Hebrews nails it down. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's read a couple of verses out of Hebrews. All right. I hope you're catching something on this this morning. We're stretching just a little bit when we talk about not looking to Jesus. Yeah, the whole church is still looking to Jesus. We're looking to Jesus to meet our needs. We're looking to Jesus to heal us. We're looking to Jesus to meet our finances. Not, no, you need to look at your problems, your circumstances, all the situations of life, knowing that you are the Christed one in the earth. And to see them as Jesus sees them. Now we're going to talk more a little bit this week and next week about manifesting from the invisible to the visible. And you're already doing that in some areas. You just now have to perfect it as Jesus was perfected in it. And that's what the spirit of truth is leading us into to be able to handle that. All right, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12. <clears throat> Speaking about Jesus, it says, but this man... After he had offered one sacrifice of sins forever. No more sacrifice for sin. Any kind of sacrifice. From praying a prayer to asking forgiveness, that's a sacrifice for sin. No more, no more sacrificing animals. Sacrifice for sin. See, our, our confessing our sins is the New, New Testament view of killing a bull. That's our sacrifice, right? He said no more sacrifice for sins. Why? Because he finished it. This one, this one man, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 13. From that time waiting till his enemies were made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected us forever who are being perfected in that process. His job is done. All right, he's setting down. That's what it says. He's setting down. When you set down, that means you're at rest. It's over. It's done. And he's confident that we will get it. And um, as him do our part now, we will demonstrate, make every enemy under his footstool. Doesn't mean we have to fight them. Doesn't mean we have to come against them. It just means we demonstrate Oh boy, as we demonstrate his love, his joy, his peace, his long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, mildness, all those nine fruits of the Spirit, we demonstrate those in this world. Do you know what that does? That acts as kryptonite. That acts as kryptonite to religion. It acts as kryptonite to performance. And it begins to bow the knee of every adversarial force that does not conform to the image of Jesus. And he's fully invested in us. He's pushed all his chips to the middle of the table for us. Verse 14 says that he is forever perfecting us that are being perfected. So he just keeps tweaking us. He keeps fine-tuning us. He sees those attitudes. He sees, you know, those little, those little character flaws and deficiencies. And he keeps tuning those out. There isn't anything more to do for us to accomplish except to discover what has already been affirmed by the resurrection but we were religiously veiled to it we have had all kind of junk pushed on top of us so this morning my the thrust of my message <clears throat> is trying to get us to no longer look to Jesus which is what he was in John 16 he's trying to get the disciples saying no longer can you look to me I'm sending a helper so that you can see as I see. So how did, how did Jesus see? 
Here's how the son named Jesus looked. And here's how we are to see. Here's how, here's how Jesus sees life. Right? This is what was built into Jesus. Let me give five real quick things. I won't, I won't elaborate. Let me just tick them off. First of all, he knew his sonship and his divinity. See, until we're convinced that we are sons and that divinity is our identity, we're not going any further. This is what grace has taken us to. Unmerited favor. This is what the favor of God has taken to us. This is what his divine influence is changing us into as we just rest in him, right? He knew his sonship and divinity. Jesus, when he saw, he was able to pull from the unseen to the seen. That's number two. Number three, Jesus learned how to just rest, trust, and believe. Everything in the Father. He, 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 his total gaze was on the Father. Number four, he was, knew that he was connected to a supply that would never exhaust itself. When my God will meet all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, is Paul's way of saying you are connected to a, a resource that will never run out. You're connected, to, you're connected to a bank account that you can write check after check after check for. Jesus knew that. All right? That's how he saw life. And number five, he depended on nobody to meet his needs. You notice Jesus never begged anybody. Jesus never cut corners. Jesus never had a hustle. Jesus never had a scheme. Jesus never did a self-promotion. Jesus never had glossy flyers. Jesus never had a business card. Jesus never ran advertising. Jesus would go out in the middle of nowhere and a crowd would show up. He never depended on anybody for anything. He rested, he trusted, and he believed. And he taught us the same lifestyle. He said, this is the lifestyle that I want you to live. I want you to, I want you to get looking at the Father, see as I see, don't look to me anymore. I'm, look, guys, I'm coming out of the middle of this thing. All right? You're, you're going to have a direct hook to the Father. Now, he taught us that lifestyle in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, when Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount, he's teaching us this lifestyle. And this is, this is incredibly important to get. Let me, let me read this. Here's, here's how Jesus sees. And this is what he's saying. This is how I want you to see life. All right, let's pick it up. Verse 25. Jesus said, therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you eat, what you drink, what you're, what, what's going to happen to your body, what you put on it, for life is more than food in the body, more than clothing. Then he draws a natural illustration. He said, look at the birds of the air. He said, they don't reap in barns, uh, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Aren't you of more value than this bird? Yes. Which of, you, about, which of you worrying can add one cubit to a stature? Which of you can change the situation by worry? You know, worry is nothing but faith in the negative. That's what worry is. You ponder the negative. You think on the negative. You meditate the ne negative. Guess what you manifest? You manifest the negative. Where, where, wherever your focus is, that's where your energy flows. Did you, did you hear me? Wherever your focus is, that's where your energy flows. If your focus is on the negative, your energy flows that way and you create it. Then he goes on in verse 29 and says, And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, won't he much more clothe you you of little faith. Therefore, all right, here's the conclusion. Therefore, verse 31, don't worry saying, what do we eat? What do we drink? What do we wear? All these things, the Gentiles, you know, the non-believers, the they, they seek for your heavenly father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things sufficient for the day is its own trouble. All right. He's setting some conscious priorities here. He's showing us how he sees life. He's showing us uh, his personal philosophy. He's showing us insight on how to receive as he received. We, we, we all, we've lived all of our life and we've been totally programmed opposite to what Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34 is. We've, we've, all, we've all been programmed totally opposite. We've all been programmed... Uh, uh, that we need to
to worry. We need to, you know, if you're not worrying, if you're not stressed out, then you're really not uh, caring. You're not caring. If you're worrying and you're stressed out and you can't sleep at night and your stomach's churning and you got a, you got a headache, you know, okay, then, then now, you're, now you're really getting somewhere. Now you're, you're setting yourself in good position like everybody. That's not what Jesus taught us. He cha- taught us, and we've been so programmed against it that when we, when we look at what Jesus said in Matthew ch- chapter 6, verse uh, 25 to 34, we either think that it's foolish or it's impossible. We don't take serious what he told us there. Now he's, it's like reading a foreign language. This doesn't compute when he says, don't worry, don't stress. God will take care of you. Jesus, this is how I see life. This is, and Jesus is saying, don't look to me. I'm telling you who to look to as your source. It's the Father. So he tells us in that 31st and 32nd verse, he says, you can sweat it, you can try to produce, or you can rest, you can trust, you can believe, knowing the Father is already fully aware, totally fully aware. Are you listening to me? You over in Ohio, you need to hear this. Or you people in Indiana, you need to check out on this. He's telling us, God already knows what you have need of. You can stress, you can sweat, you can try to produce which, which the ego craves independence. The ego wants to say, I can handle this. I can do this. Now, here's the problem with ego. <laughs> ego fails all the time. And so because ego fails all of the time, it creates stress in our life. We're not sure it'll really happen. We, we want to feel like we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, like we can, we can do this thing, we can provide for ourselves, we can earn. And so... Ego says, I, 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 let me just get a hold of this thing. I can, I, can, I can do it. But then we know in the back of our mind, man, how many times I failed. Ego has let me down. It has a terrible track record for failure. So here's where Jesus says, so he, he lays all of that out in verses 25 down through 32. <coughs> and then in verse 33, he says, here's where I want you to put your energy. Here's, here's how I live. Here's how I see. Here's how I want you to put your energy This is what you tune your ear to. This is what you focus your eyes on. Verse 33, he says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things you're sweating, stressing, trying to produce, they will be added to you. So Jesus says, There is one thing you focus on. And for me, I'll tell you what, this is one of the biggest revelations in my life, seriously. This makes my life simpler. This is, this, this is the one focus. This explains why Jesus was never in a hurry. Jesus never panicked. He never got in a sweat. He had one focus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all this stuff you're sweating about, those things will be added. Now listen to me very closely. Some of you need to hear this. Listen closely. Seeking first the kingdom of God, putting one focus, making life simple, that doesn't mean that everything is going to drop on you like ripe apples out of a tree. I think, I know, I know some people that live like that. Well, you know, God knows I need it. It'll just, it'll pop up. It'll show up some way. No, that's not what he's saying. What is he saying here? When you seek first the kingdom of God, out of that kingdom focus, out of that invisible kingdom within you will come direction, will come a word, will come a prompting. And out of that prompting, out of that word that rises within you, will come a direction to produce in the visible all of your needs. When, you're, when you've got the one focus, okay, I, 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 I need things in my life. God knows I need them, Right? Here's my job. My job is to focus on the kingdom, get filled with the kingdom, become father conscious. And as I sit in his presence, you know what? He will tell me something to do. Now that's that's taking an invisible kingdom that is within. And that is beginning to produce now in the visible realm without. That's how Jesus lived. When Jesus fed the multitude with five loaves and two fish, you know what he did? 
He was seeking first the kingdom of God. And out of that, here was the instruction of what to do. You need a job, right? You need finances. Rather than send out 600 resumes, rather than get on a computer and just bat it crazy, get quiet and listen. He will direct your steps. Steps of a righteous man are order to the Lord. He will direct your step. He will give you an instruction. Now, he may tell you, look, get on, the, get on the internet and set on a resume to every place you can. He will direct you. Do you see, that's taking, that is manifesting the invisible from within to the visible that is without. He's saying, you put the focus on the kingdom and I will, I will speak to you. I will tell you what to do. I'll direct your steps. There will come a direction to produce in the visible all your needs. That's manifest, that is manifesting in the visible from the invisible. Now, it may involve speaking to that mountain. It may, it, it, it may involve doing what seems illogical. It might involve stillness and listening within. I can tell you that it will for sure involve stillness and listening within and quieting your emotions down, settling yourself down. We want to see like Jesus sees. Jesus didn't panic. Jesus didn't get in a hurry. Jesus wasn't uptight. He wasn't stressed out. See, this is what grace does. This is some of the change grace brings in your life. So I hope you've got a strong foundation in grace. If you don't have a foundation in grace, get back on, on YouTube and look at some of the old teachings I did, like grace versus radical grace, or, you know, there's, there's a gazillion teachings there. You need to get the foundation tight, because we're, we're taking grace and we're moving it to be as he is in this present world. The invisible kingdom will manifest through unlimited ways. The matrix is unlimited. It'll manifest in unlimited ways to sons who embrace their divinity, who know who they are, who have a right identity, and who put a focus that is strictly on the kingdom, who have aligned themselves to see as he sees and to think as he thinks. Now, if Jesus were here in the flesh, you wouldn't develop any of those things. You just run to Jesus and say, Jesus, look, I need 20 bucks to get me home tonight. Jesus, I need, I need a truckload of groceries. If Jesus were here in the flesh, you'd just run to Jesus and say, Jesus, look, here, here's what I need. Wave the wand and produce it. Now, do you understand why he says it's expedient? It's to your advantage if I go away. Because now you're going to have to learn not to get the fish from me. You're going to have to learn how to fish for yourself. But I have demonstrated for you how to do it. Then I'm going to send someone that will abide with you and be in you that will direct you to all truth. Now you just have to learn to listen to his direction. So we need to be aware of where our focus is. Where's your focus today, this morning? Where's your focus? Is, it, is your focus on the kingdom or is your focus on solving needs? Which one are you really focused on? Are you all bent out of shape about your needs, your lacks, your wants, your desires, and that's where you're spending all of your focus time? Remember, remember I told you where your focus is, that's where your energy flows. If your focus is on the kingdom, the energy will flow to the kingdom, and out of that kingdom will come production. He tells us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 to 34, not to focus any more than the birds focus on our needs but to rest, to trust, to believe. You notice in that verse, Jesus said, don't seek healing. He didn't say seek healing. He didn't say seek prosperity. He didn't say seek freedom from fear. He said, seek the kingdom. The invisible kingdom, if focused on, will manifest, will rise within you, direct you, speak to you, tell you how to meet those needs by directing your steps. David, a, a, a man that was after God's own heart in Psalm chapter 37. Let me read what David said, because even back then, David understood some of this, although it certainly wasn't, uh, you know, on the level that we're seeing today. But David, David said in Psalm chapter 37, verse 23, David said this. He said, the, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he falls, though we make mistakes, though we think we hear and we wander off and do something crazy. 
He shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. He said, I've, I've been young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging for bread. So one of, one of the biggest advantages out of embracing divinity, growing as a son, is the confidence that it gives to us when we see him now beginning to do things in our life that were never done before and we couldn't do ourselves. All of a sudden, you're, you're, you're needing a job and you're, you're just waiting on God, you're listening, and within your spirit, you hear this. Talk to so-and-so. Go apply here. Do this. All right. Do you see, that's coming out of an invisible, but it's going to manifest in the visible. It's coming out of the invisible within to produce the visible that is without. So when you, when you think, well, look at Jesus, how, all, all the things he made happen that nobody could see, you're functioning in the same thing. The difference is he was highly, highly developed in it. And we're just napiasas. We're just infants. We're just starting down this trail. But I'm telling you, we're going to get there. As a resurrection birthed, new creation, not only are you embracing your divinity, but you're seeing how to live out of the flow of the kingdom within through revelation knowledge that arises. Does it come out of your head? Does it come by your, the senses? Now, I know some of you are not wanting, you don't want to spend the time to get quiet. You don't want to spend the time to listen. Grace has moved you into a higher consciousness. It's moved you into a different realm. But you're, you're still antsy. You haven't developed that ability to just sit on, shut up and listen. He's developing that ability to rest, trust, believe. And that positions you, the resting, the trusting, the believing, positions you to live not by your works in the natural, it, it positions you now that you can start living out of this divine enablement. But let me go back to what I was saying. If you don't have a foundation in grace, if, you're, if, if you don't understand that all of this is entirely the working of the Father through the Son and the Spirit in your life, that it's nothing of you. This is not your ability. It's not your uh, wisdom. Then you will never grasp living simply out of favor, you'll move back into living out of sweat. That's, how, that's where you'll go. But if you've got a foundation of grace, then you can move off of that. See, the kingdom of God, the favor of God, produces because of who he is. And I hope by now, everything I've taught, man, you have seen that this God is so big. He is, the, he is the sustainer. He's the maintainer. He's the upholder of the entire universe. I'm going to run through five scriptures real fast just to impress this on you. You might make a note of these five. Because look, we serve a big God. So when this big God says, look, I'm going to move in your life. I'm going to do things in your life. All I ask you, focus on the kingdom. I'll speak to you within. I'll direct your steps, tell you what to do to manifest on the outside what I'm speaking to you out of this invisible kingdom within. I'm, just, I'm going to nail you down five scriptures real quick just to show you that he is the creator, sustainer, maintainer, and upholder of the entire universe. In Matthew chapter 11, I'm not going to comment on these because I think that you can see, if I just read them to you, you can see how big he really becomes. Matthew, uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 36 says, For of him, through him, and to him are all things. They come from him, they pass through him, and they end up with him. Everything. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. It says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and he upholds all things, everything, by the word of his power. By the word of his power. All right, I want, to go, I want to go to a couple more. Colossians chapter 1, 17. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 17. All right, so you got Romans eleven thirty six. 36. You have Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Let me read to you Colossians chapter 1, 17. And he is above all things. And in, he is above all things. And in him all things things consist. I'm telling you, he's big. You can't get away from him. 
And it's one that is big and you can't get away from. He has said, I will just focus on it. Rest, trust, believe, focus on this kingdom within. And I'm going to tell you, I'm, I, I, I wired you. I wired you up. I know how to get the message to you. One, one more. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6. Yet for us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. So I just read those five verses to show you he's the sustainer, he is the creator, he's the maintainer, and he is the upholder, man, of the entire universe. And you are one with him. You're one with him. His favor, this favor that he has for you is sustained by his omnipotence. He is the one power. It's sustained by his omniscience. He is the one mind. It is sustained by his omnipresence. There is only one presence from which there is no vacant place. You cannot escape omnipresence. You cannot get outside of where he is. So you're not going to fall through the cracks. You don't have to feel like, man, maybe God doesn't see me over here. God, doesn't, God isn't looking at these, these, he's not aware of my situation. Yes, he is, he's omnipresent. He knows exactly. So when you get, you know when you're omnipresent, let, can I tell you this? That whenever you get to where you're going, God's already there. And he's already cleared the path for you to get to where you're going if you're following his direction to get there. He is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He is the one and only. There is none like him. Those three make him God. Make him the sustainer. There's none but him. He is all in all, and you're one with him. So setting first the kingdom of God, seeking first the kingdom of God, setting that as your focus, as your priority, means that you fill your awareness with oneness, with this this sustainer, this creator, this upholder. You fill your mind with oneness, not problems and difficulties. If you're going to meditate on anything, don't meditate on the problem. Don't, don't spend your emotional energy on what you think is the need. Spend your time. Think of oneness. Don't think of good or evil. Leave that decision to him. Let him make that call. If you're going to cease looking to Jesus and the church is still looking to Jesus. You ever been to a church prayer meeting lately? The whole, the whole prayer meeting is about bawling and squalling and crying out to Jesus to come do something. We're still looking to Jesus. The church as a whole has not gotten the idea that we are to see as Jesus. I'm not talking about what would Jesus do. That's still, that's still dualism. What would he do? Then I'm going to do what he would do. I'm talking about you understanding your divinity, your sonship, and you looking with the eyes of Jesus. If you're going to do that, then you have to fill your mind up with father consciousness like Jesus did. You're going to have to start relying on that pull that you feel within and not the data the five senses are feeding to you. That's called tree of life versus tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We bring from the unseen to the seen by meditating and then responding to the prompting that comes from the stillness that arises from the meditation. That stillness, that kingdom consciousness, that, that spirit focusness, that spirit focus. That's the connector. Look, that's the connector between the unseen and the seen. How do I produce in the seen from the unseen, we do it through the meditation, through kingdom consciousness, through spirit focus, by looking at the kingdom and nothing else, but letting our energy flow in that direction. How, how does that look? How does that work? Well, Jesus said it like this. Maybe, this. maybe this will ring the bell. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. Now, how did Jesus see what the Father does? Did he see with his natural eye? Absolutely not. He saw from within. And when he saw from within what the Father does, then he did the same. He said, I only say what I hear the Father say. Did he hear what the Father says with his physical ears? No, he heard it within. And then he would say what he heard the Father say. 
What, what do you think would happen if we just waited to do what we were prompted inside knowing that that's what the Father would do? What do you think would happen if we held our mouth and our tongue and didn't say except what he said to us? I'll tell you what would happen. We would become more highly developed in producing from the invisible to the visible. That connector would get stronger. I, I'm going to finish with this scripture. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Verse 4. I'm, let me read verses 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Verse 4. He said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. All right, he's saying get your mind right. Get your thinking straight. Then in verse 6, he says, Be anxious for nothing. Don't sweat anything. But by prayer and supplication, all right, by getting quiet, by focusing on the kingdom, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Right? So when you're, when you're uh, quiet, you're letting God know, God, you, you know my life. You know where I need to go. You know what I need to do. Uh, I'm looking for you. I'm looking to hear your direction. I'm looking to see what you would see. And when you say something, I will say it. When I see you doing something, that's what I will do. And in the meantime, I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to, I'm going to supplicate. I'm going to be thankful. And it says in verse 7 that when you do that, the result will be the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will put a guard around your heart and your mind so that nothing can penetrate of anxiety and stress. And the God of peace, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. How many of you wanted the peace of God, but you haven't settled down to get your mind right? Verses 4 and 5. You haven't moved from the natural kingdom to the kingdom of God in verse 6 by not being anxious anymore, but by supplicating and thanksgiving to God. You haven't moved yet. You're still teetering back and forth. And then in verse 8, he says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praiseworthy, meditate on those things. Fill those things, your consciousness full of those things. Put on that mind of oneness. It's, it's not Jesus and you anymore. There's no two. It's you as Jesus. Jesus as you. There's one. When he speaks, you're going to know it. Somebody, well, I don't hear God. Yeah, you do. He said his sheep hear his voice. I don't hear him. Yeah, you do. He said his sheep hear his voice. But he just doesn't talk to me. Yes, he does. His sheep hear his voice. When he speaks to you, you will absolutely know it. And then you can speak that word and take that action. And that word that he speaks that you act on will not return void. It will not return void. He said it was to our advantage if he left. But he would come back to dwell as us. So what, what are we doing? We're growing up in him in all things. He's placing his brothers all over the planet doing what he did until the leaven is leavened, the entire lump in the kingdom covers the entire earth. Guys, what a great day to be alive. What an awesome time we have to grow and develop. Let's take full advantage of it. Let's, let's walk in this unlimited kingdom. Let's move the invisible to the visible and follow what he says. Let's focus on one thing. Let's focus on the kingdom. What a fulfilling existence we have. God bless you. I hope you got something out of this. Receive it all. Go back and listen again. Take notes. Look at the scriptures. Let's talk about it Wednesday night, and we will see you next Sunday morning at the Digital Cathedral. God bless. Have a wonderful week.